fun with this thing. probably gave every rocket scientist an orgasm. Everyone gracefully flies through a calmer and soothing part of space. Well, almost everyone. Hey, Jimmy! Do you think we can rotate ships after a while? Hey, we'll switch! But they ain't gonna have time to rotate because they gotta go through another pretty awesome scene where they gotta avoid a meteor shower. I find it kind of funny how the Viking ship and Sheen gets hit, but none of the bigger rides do. Also, I just want to ask, which ride would you hate to be on during this? I'd personally hate to be on the Octopuke back here. I love these rides, but to also avoid a meteor shower in the process, I'd be blowing out Yoki and Chunks in 2.0982 seconds. They land on an asteroid for the... Uh... Night? I guess? Where Nick feels like telling the story of the... Blair Witch Project. He sticks in the trees, shaped like stick people. And the girl filmmaker starts crying, and her nose starts dripping, and they don't have any tissue at all. So they leave the tent. Don't let the tent! Don't let the tent! So the next day, I guess? They continue their journey and make it to the Yokian's planet known as Yokus. I'm pretty sure. Citizens of Yokus! Jimmy, Carl, Sheen, Cindy, and Libby go down as the scouting party while everyone else stays behind. They don't scout for too long as they find the parents lined up wearing mind-controlled helmets. Dad, Dad! It's me, Jimmy! <gasps> Over here! Jim, 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 Jimmy's James, James, Jim, big fiery flying Jimmy. Hi, uh, Jimmy. Some dream, huh? I Attack of the Big Egg People. I think I've seen this one before. No, Dad. You're wearing a mind control device. Take yours off. Hurry. Dad? Intruder alert. Intruder alert. Dad, no, no, no. Jimmy, your dad's like a mind control duck man. Let's get out of here. Come back. Join us, Jimmy. Join us. They get caught, though, and are brought to the hard-boiled king himself. Well, well. Littlest rescue party. How cute! Hello, itty bitty humans. I'm here to warn you that if you don't release us within 24 hours, an army of highly trained combat specialists is poised to destroy your entire planet. Oh my, our entire planet? Whatever shall we do? Do you mean this army of highly trained combat specialists? Yeah, did I forget to mention that when they built the rockets, they didn't include weapons on them? I think the only thing relating to a weapon was Cindy and Libby's rocket having a drill on the front. Everyone finds out why the parents were taken. What do you want with our parents? Oh, it's not what I want. It's what Poltra wants. Who's Poltra? Poltra is our god! And now there goes any mystery or build-up for its reveal. The name is one letter away from poultry, which everyone knows is chicken. Except for the kids in this flick, but don't pay any mind to that. The only bit of reveal you can have now is what exactly this chicken looks like. Hello and welcome to our special edition of Poltra God of Wrath. Brought to you by Goomblast. Commercials. Hate them. Welcome back. If you're watching this, chances are your friends and or relatives are about to be sacrificed to the mighty Poltra. Also, everyone finds out it was Jimmy's fault for the whole egduction in the first place. And it's all thanks to Jimmy Neutron. <laughs> Greetings from planet Earth. I'm Jimmy Neutron. And you're an <laughs> alien life form. You know, without the coordinates you gave us, we never would have found your puny little planet. The kids are sent to prison cells, and Ublar takes Gutter to disassemble them. Then we gotta have a scene where everyone is, of course, mad at Jimmy. Space well, except for one obvious character with a sudden change of heart. Don't listen to them. They're just scared. Uh, okay, so you made a mistake. 
Beating yourself up isn't gonna fix anything. You know, I was the smartest kid in school until you came along. And I admit you know more about some things than I do. But I know one thing that you don't seem to get. And that's that we're never getting out of here without you. So why don't you buck up, mister? And put that big brain of yours back to work. This helps motivate him into coming up with a plan. He calls Goddard, and while on speakerphone, imitates a self-destruct voice. Danger! Danger! You have initiated self-destruct sequence alpha. Ooh, that's my bad. Back and you go. Self-destruct sequence is now engaged. No, 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 no! I put it back in! You understand me? This unit will yield a 50 megaton nuclear blast in exactly 10 seconds. That's not good! Please clear a 30 square mile area. Thank you, and have a nice day. Who goes there? Oh, oh, the guard! By order of the most esteemed King Gubat, it is my great privilege and honor to mercilessly exterminate you. Goddard plays dead, which actually makes him self-destruct. <laughs> but he can reassemble himself. Why didn't he just do that in the room with Ublar? They head to the outskirts of a stadium where the poultry ritual is taking place. Kick it! Yeah, that's good and all, but I would have preferred this. Kick it! As the kids make their way to the stadium, Poltro gets in the process of being hatched. But it's okay, cause Nick is here to ch 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 these Benedicts to death. Cool spear. Well, you really think so? Well, yeah, I guess so, because I Mind saw this. I try. <laughs> 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 So, here she is. With Poultry release, Jimmy now has two major issues. Had to rescue the parents, and had to actually leave the planet. Wow, that was a pretty pointless brain blast. He just looks at the remote control and the rocket and immediately goes through that whole process. Okay. Cindy, Libby, you and the others keep the guards busy until Sheen arrives with the ship. Okay, I heard the ship part, but um, was that Sheen get the ship? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, oh. Listen, there's a transport ship in that airfield big enough to carry all of us out of here. I need you to get it here as fast as you can. But I, I don't have a driver's license. I have no hand-eye uh, coordination. Sheen. Ask yourself, what would Ultra Lord do? I accept this responsibility, understanding the consequences that you've bestowed against me. But I gotta admit, what follows is pretty awesome too. Now who's gonna kick butt up? The carbonated life forms! Yeah! All the kids scrambling with the Yogian army and the more important characters using their quirky traits to fight them. Stop those kids!
Jimmy gets the remote control that somehow controls every single parent, and they try to escape the stadium. Not gonna lie, I would have liked to see how she managed to get a hold of it. Man, Sheen flies two rockets in this flick and neither instance do you see him launch. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, what would have been the plan if they didn't have this particular rocket and still had the rides? To my knowledge, every single ride was full unless they had room on the Ferris wheel which even then probably wouldn't have had enough space for everyone. But they escape, making Poltro's reveal, and existence for that matter, pointless. But Goobot's not finished. <laughs> Time to discipline the naughty children. However, Jimmy has ideas of his own to fight them off. Okay, who wants fried chicken? And much like the logic of the larger rides in the meteor shower not getting hit, Goobot Ship is the only one to make it out despite being the biggest. Neutron, now it's just you and I! All weapons online! <laughs> However, Jimmy's got one more plan up his sleeve. I know we haven't field tested this feature yet, but we have no choice, buddy. With his shrink ray, he switches it to a growth ray and makes himself massive. No, not tiny! Now, he practically has the power to do anything he wants to kill these guys. <sighs> <sighs> Sorry that I expected a bit more creativity from the boy genius. But Goobot and Ublar get executed, and Jimmy reunites with everyone on the ship and hopes that both him and the other kids do not get a year-long grounding for all the littering that they did and for practically stealing all the rides at Retroland and then losing them. Dad, I should have listened to you when you said don't talk to strangers. See, I guess I thought I was smart enough to do everything on my own. That I didn't need you. But I was wrong. I love you guys. Ooh, we love you too, Jimmy. Having a genius for a son may not always be easy, but it's always interesting. So giving a hostile alien race the directions to Earth, causing you to get abducted and mind controlled to be sacrificed to a giant chicken god that is probably slightly cleaner than anything at KFC is fine, but setting a very small fire to a curtain was still the last straw. Okay. And I guess the moral of this sort of combines be careful what you wish for and always be kind to your parents. Don't take them for granted or get mad at them so quick. They're definitely not bad messages, but I feel like it's a little too easy to do. You know what I mean? Doesn't really challenge kids or makes them think much. Kind of a spoon-fed moral. Carl and Jimmy are treated to irony breakfast and the movie basically ends here. <laughs> What are the final thoughts? This movie is fairly imaginative and has very creative ideas that work very well. Carl and Sheen are very funny characters, but what helps are two things. First is when they try listening to Jimmy and are obligated to respond to something. According to the Newville Journal of Medicine, monkeys are easily influenced by positive reinforcement, e.g. the giving of a banana. And since human and monkey DNA only differ by 2%, the same principle should work on our parents. My dad's allergic to bananas. Second is who they are voiced by. Carl is done by Yakko and Pinky voice actor Rob Paulson. And the way he makes his voice kind of high-pitched and nasally cracks me up. In fact, there is one line here that even when I think about it, I just want to laugh so hard. I don't digest pulp well. It makes me bloaty. Sheen is voiced by Jeffrey Garcia, and he's not a screamer per se. He's just a very excited and jittery kid. His obsession with collecting Ultralord figures is so hilarious because most audiences can either relate to this or know someone who is like this. You got the super mint condition figure that you know will be so valuable in the future, and the moment you unbox it, its condition is ruined. 
King Goobot's a cool villain. He's got Patrick Stewart to give him a really nice booming voice. And as I said before, I like how unpredictable his voice can be when he changes moods in an instant. And I will say, I make fun of them a lot, but I think the Yokian race as a concept is a very creative one. But nowhere is creativity best described than the rocket launch scene. I already fanboyed over it. Go watch the ending to part one if you want to know my thoughts on that. So I'll make this quick. One of my favorite sequences of all time in any movie whatsoever. If the entire movie was just this on repeat, I'd totally be fine with that. I'd give this movie a 10 out of 10. So spoilers, I'm not gonna give the movie a 10 out of 10 in this review. And this isn't really much of a pro as much as it is a side note, but I really like how it was all of the kids in Retroville that went on this journey, and not just the primary characters. It gives Kids in America even more of a purpose in this film. It shows that everyone is in this, and I wish more films would stop the cliche of only the main character or main character and two of their sidekicks or friends joining them for something important or, you know, a final climax scene. With any movie, the main character can boost it from good to great. Unfortunately, Jimmy is not that main character. It mainly stems from how the creators wanted him to be, but then not going all the way with it. He's supposed to be a very smart kid. That is where the boy genius title comes in. But he sometimes makes so many simple yet critical mistakes that he leaves you yelling at the screen rather than sympathizing with them. Examples, the fake note obviously being the biggest one. With how smart he comes off as, he should have read that note on the fridge and immediately realized something was up. Not wait an entire day, watch that recording from Goddard, and then literally scan like five other notes to make sure it's fake. Another thing is he doesn't even invent a gadget he can carry with him or have on his person to keep up on the tracking process. Because he only checks the monitor one time before the invasion happens. And these are just things that don't make sense to me from what's supposed to be a very intelligent character. His quirk is that all of his inventions eventually glitch out. And honestly, they should have kept it that way. Because experiments and inventions can glitch out and break all the time. Even when made or tested by real scientists. So it wouldn't be as far-fetched of an idea. And I didn't really care for Cindy, at least in the movie. In the show, she has a bit more personality because you can actually develop characters easier in an episodic manner. But here, she's just a rival making fun of Jimmy and then has a fairly rushed arc that shows she likes Jimmy even though she also likes Nick. And then she almost falls into a Disney formula of not having to make a decision or, you know, which one she'd rather be with. Nick just kind of shrugs her off for some reason. Guess she didn't have a pencil she could drop. So now they make it an obvious choice for who she should like. I think it would have been a nice change of pace for her to continue being that rival throughout without being so easy to have a change of heart. And yes, I am including Nick on here because that's his only purpose. Sure, he gives the idea for Jimmy, Carl, and Sheen to sneak out, but it could have also been anyone to tell him. Heck, Jimmy could have had that plan on his own had the bribing plan not worked. Plus, it's not like he remembers Nick telling him to sneak out. He got the idea officially from Goddard, of which was not with Jimmy when Nick gave them the idea. Also, his character all leads to only one joke. Laid back, popular, makes fifth graders sigh with possible fantasies, but then... <coughs> So now, if you happen to have not laughed at this moment, then he was a complete waste of time. To express my thought on this punchline, I'll have Gordon Ramsay break it to you. Not good enough. I'm not putting Libby on here just because she's in the background all the time and other than killing one Yokian with her music, she doesn't do anything. You don't do anything, you technically didn't do anything wrong. Probably an odd thing you'd see in this cons list is the logic of this world. Obviously it's a cartoon and they don't have to abide by real life physics, but what's the point in doing that sometimes but not all the time? Like how the pilots in the beginning were wearing oxygen masks, but everyone else can survive in space without space suits or oxygen supply. Goddard can self-destruct on command and reassemble, but it's a big deal when he's just gonna get disassembled with a screwdriver. 
Yokians are this hyper advanced alien species but can't figure out where Earth is on their own. Jimmy scans all of Retroville to find adults and doesn't find any even though Miss Fowl is still around. She's just shrunk. And the Ultra Lord impersonator should have still been around. Those are but a few examples of things that just leave your head scratching when you think about stuff too much. Paltra was a wasted opportunity, if you ask me. There wasn't a whole lot of build-up to her reveal, and she doesn't do much except stare at her food and squawk a couple times. Plus, she appears about an hour and six minutes into this hour and 18 minute movie, excluding credits, and her scene only lasts for about five minutes. Also, probably another thing to put on here is the brain blasts. These are supposed to be the highlighted moments for Jimmy. Taking everything he's experienced in his adventure to come up with a grand solution. But that didn't happen here. I'm not gonna fault the first one, cause it's something we'd have to get accustomed to. But the second one was such a letdown. He looks at the rocket they can use to escape, the helmet, and the remote control. And then goes through that brain blast sequence. In fact, I want to talk about one of my favorite Brain Blast moments from the show to give an idea on how underwhelming the movies is. And yes, it'll involve going through a short synopsis of an episode, so just bear with me. In the episode Return of the Nanobots, Jimmy recreates robots that existed in another episode to help fix errors. Jimmy's intent was for them to help him with his homework errors. For this episode, it's a poem he needs help with, so it surpasses Cindy's. Keep in mind, this already is a key ingredient for the Brain Blast. Eventually, the nanobots take fixing errors a little too far and start deleting every human on Earth except for Jimmy and Hugh. Hugh had a mini-story where he thinks he's the last human on Earth, so he surrounds himself with one of his running jokes of the show, Pi. As the bots go after Jimmy to make him the last one deleted, Jimmy overhears Hugh say this. Endless pie. Endless pie. And then he brain blasts about those two words, endless and pie. He edits his poem from the beginning of the episode to say the mathematic term pi is equal to 3. Of course, because the bots are programmed to fix errors, they are forced to read out the entirety of this improper fraction in decimal form. Which, as you may know, doesn't end. In other words, endless pi. Sure, he heard Hugh say it like a minute before the brain blast started, but we already had a great setup with the poem. He didn't suddenly whip out a poem as he's fleeing from the bots, hear his dad say that, and start the brain blast. Here in the movie, there's no build-up, nor setup. And I suppose we might as well discuss the most important factor of this movie, the animation. Being that this is the first Nickelodeon cartoon to be in 3D, you probably shouldn't expect anything spectacular, but to be fair, it's not bad here. Yes, there are other 3D animated children's films that came out before it and looked better, but a lot of settings and structures do look good. I will say where it does suffer is some character animation and just needed a little bit more polish. It usually seems like things in the backgrounds don't move much and inanimate objects only have their own physics if the camera is specifically targeting it. Now, I'll give it credit for having reflections accurate if a character is near a window, good shadow placement, and there are times where the background is a little active. But then there are other little things. Like in the classroom, this American flag just looks frozen in time, and I think it would have been very nice polish to give it a little bit of motion near the bottom of it. The rocket launch, Yokus, and the meteor shower are very nicely animated, but then when we are indoors, it looks like the outside is just a 2D image. The globe here looks very flat, but who am I kidding? There are people out there who believe that's accurate. Branches and leaves don't really get much physics unless they are very close to the camera, and I think you get the idea. For me, I've seen every episode of the show, so the animation in general doesn't bug me. It may look weird if you see it for the first time, but it's one of those things where you can just watch the movie to know if you're into it or not. I did get used to it, so in my book the animation is good enough to be a pro. For my personal rating, I give it a solid 7. Not gonna lie, the movie feels a little slow up until the rocket launch, and while I know you do need to have setup and character development, I feel more fun stuff could have happened before the rocket launch. The montage in Retroland was kind of fun, but it ends pretty quick. Doesn't give us much time to be immersed into the environment. 
And yeah, well, you could say the rocket launch was a large factor in determining this rating. And you wouldn't be wrong. I do like Carl Sheen and Goobot. I enjoy the fight in the stadium and the meteor shower. What mainly holds the movie back for me, though, is Jimmy's inconsistency and Poltra. And you know what? For the first time, I'm gonna give my realistic rating the exact same verdict for the exact same reasons. It may not be a perfect movie, but it's one that I like to rewatch on occasion. And seeing how it spawned a whole cartoon series, seems like I'm not the only one who enjoyed it. So, even though this movie has aliens in it, I don't know if you would consider this a Halloween-y movie. And being that part one was blocked worldwide for two months, that may happen to this part as well. But nonetheless, I will be sure to give you a Halloween-y review probably around Christmas time. Again, because I guess I can't seem to stay away from technically scary movies around Christmas time. So. I guess that's gonna be a thing now. I don't know. And I hope you're just as excited as I am, because we going from G-rated film to an R-rated one. Catch you guys then. Baby, engaging both rockets now!